Good afternoon. Welcome to AEI and today's book preview event, Floored, How a Misguided Fed Experiment Deepened and Prolonged the Great Recession by George Selgin of the Cato Institute. On October 13, 2006, the 109th U.S. Congress passed a little publicized law, the Financial Services Regulatory Relief Act. Article 201 of the act amended existing law by adding the following single sentence. In general, balances maintained at, the Federal Reserve, at a Federal Reserve Bank by or on behalf of a depository institution may receive earnings to be paid by the Federal Reserve Bank at least once each calendar quarter at a rate or rates not to exceed the general level of short-term interest rates. Legislatures never imagined that these three, three seemingly innocuous lines in the legislation would empower the Federal Reserve to completely change the way it conducts monetary policy, and to do so without any further legislation or consultation with the Congress. At the time Congress passed the Financial Services Regulatory Relief Act of 2006, interest on bank reserves represented little more than rounding error in the Fed's combined statement of operations, the financial statement that reports the profit the Fed remits to the U.S. Treasury each year. The, author the authorization allowing the Fed to pay interest on reserves was not supposed to take effect in October, until October 1, 2011, but the events of September 2008 intervened. On October 3, 2008, Congress passed the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, which permitted the Fed to begin paying interest on bank reserves retroactively, Affected October, effective October 1st, and the Fed began paying interest on October 9th. Initially, the Fed's plan was to pay banks a different rate on required reserves and excess reserves, with both rates set below the FOMC's federal funds target rate. To quote the Fed's October 9th announcement, the interest paid on required reserve balances will be the average targeted federal funds rate established by the Federal Open Market Committee over each reserve maintenance period, less 10 basis points, so 10, boys, 10 basis points below the average target federal funds rate. Paying interest on required reserves should essentially eliminate the opportunity cost of holding required reserves, promoting efficiency in the banking sector. Continuing on, the rate paid on excess balances will be set initially at the lowest targeted federal funds rate for each reserve maintenance period, less 75 basis points. But the Fed's plan was short-lived. Within weeks, the Fed began paying banks the same interest rate on both their required and excess reserves, and the single rate paid by the Fed was set higher than the, FOMC, the FOMC's federal funds target rate. Bank reserves swelled under the new Fed operating policy from $8.4 billion in October 2006 when the law was passed, first passed. Bank reserves grew to just shy of $2.8 trillion by August 2014, an increase of 33,000%. The audited financial statements of the Federal Reserve System show that in 2007, the year before the bed the Fed began paying interest on reserves, the Fed's interest expenses consumed about 4% of the interest the Fed received from its balance sheet assets. In 2017, the last audited financial statement available, the Fed's interest expense ate up 26% of the interest it earned on its balance sheet assets, a year in which the IOER rate varied between a low of 75 basis points and a high of 125 basis points. Today, with the IOER rates above 200 basis points, interest on bank reserves will consume an even larger part of the Fed's interest earnings. But the regulatory impact of this single sentence in the Financial Services Regulatory Relief Act of 2006 goes far beyond the size of the Fed's balance sheet and the value of the Fed's yearly remittances to the U.S. Treasury. The Fed's decision to pay an equal rate of interest on bank required and excess reserves and to consistently set this rate above the currently prevailing market interest rate dramatically changed the way monetary policy interacts with the economy. But you would probably never realize the importance of the changes, that, of the changes paying interest on banks' reserves had had on monetary policy if you just followed the pronouncements of senior Federal Reserve officials. 
They would have you believe that paying interest on bank reserve balances has nothing more, is nothing more than a technical adjustment in the Fed's operating policy, an adjustment that was needed to allow the FOMC to better hit its target federal funds rate. The mechanism through, through which changes in Federal Reserve monetary policy impact unemployment and inflation, the so-called monetary transmission mechanism, is an esoteric subject usually best left to academic papers and economics department happy hour discussions. However, the way in which monetary policy works, or sometimes doesn't work, is critically important for the economic well-being of all citizens, whether we realize it or not. Esoteric or not, the issue should at a minimum merit lively discussion among the congressional committees who have Federal Reserve oversight responsibility, and yet Congress has yet to launch a comprehensive review of the overall impact of its decision to allow the Fed to pay interest on bank reserves. In Floored, George Selgin does a superb job of explaining how a seemingly small change in the Federal Reserve's operating policy, paying interest on bank reserves, has fundamentally altered the way monetary policy impacts the economy. George makes a convincing case that the Fed's new operating policy has created strong incentives for banks to hoard excess reserves instead of providing loans to consumers and businesses. As George rightly points out, in its day-to-day -day operations, the, the ability to pay interest on bank reserves have shifted, has shifted the Fed's business model from being a bank lender of last resort to being bank's borrower of first resort. In George's view, these changes muted the efficacy of monetary policy and likely delayed the recovery from the Great Recession. Today, we are lucky and pleased to have George Selgin visit AEI and discuss his newest book. George Selgin is a senior fellow and director of the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives at the Cato Institute and Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Georgia. He's the author of many books, The Theory of Free Banking, Bank Deregulation and Monetary Order, Less Than Zero, The Case for a Falling Price Level in a Growing Economy, Good Money, Birmingham Button Makers, The Royal Mint, The Beginnings of Modern Coinage, and Money, Free and Unfree, and now Floored. George earned a BA in Economics and a Zoology from Drew University and has a PhD in Economics from New York University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. George Selgin. Thank you, Paul, for that very nice introduction. Thanks to all of you for coming to uh, let me uh, speak to you about my book. By the way, when I got that zoology degree, I had no idea I'd be studying central bankers. Uh, that just was fortuitous. Uh, I should uh, point out, uh, apropos of what Paul said about the Fed's uh, need to rev have a proper review of its operating system, that next summer the Fed is holding meetings at uh, the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, which will involve public input put on all kinds of aspects of Federal Reserve policy. But one of the things that's not on the table, that's explicitly not to be under public discussion, is the operating system, or as the Fed puts it, how the, how the Fed sets interest rates. And uh, one of the purposes of, of my book and also of this talk this evening uh, is to convince people at the Fed and elsewhere that the operating system should also be something we're talking about since we've had a major change in it. And uh, it's by no means obvious that that change has been for the good. But what I want to do uh, this evening in the 20 minutes or so that I have is, of course, not to try to convey all of the information in my book. That would take too long and it would prevent you from buying a copy, which is, you can do if, you, if you're quick. I think we have enough of them for most people. But uh, rather to give a quick overview of the main issues, by first reviewing the history of how the floor system came to be, this new operating system based on interest and reserves, and then talk about how it, the switch to that system contributed to the slow recovery, mainly by preventing the Fed from being as effective in countering the recession as it might have been. And finally, I want to end by talking about some of the problems 
that are ongoing problems created by the switch to a floor system that are reasons why we should consider uh, either going back to what we had or not quite what we had, going to a, an orthodox corridor system. And I'll tell you exactly what I mean by that uh, as we go along. So oh, there's my book. So first, some history. This chart will help me a lot to tell you how the floor system came into being. It shows uh, two plots, two statistics, the GNP growth rate, uh, growth, I mean GDP growth rate, that's nominal GDP, and the CPI. And our story begins really in the uh, earlier part of 2008 when uh, the Federal Reserve, or specifically the members of the FOMC, they began to become increasingly concerned about the inflation rate. And in this case, it's core inflation that I'm showing you. And uh, their concern was that it had been above the implicit then target of 2% for some time. And uh, as you can see from the chart, uh, around the midsummer, it starts going up even more. But it was roughly in April that the, Fed, the FOMC dug in its heels and said that it didn't want to let monetary policy become any easier than its then prevailing 2% interest rate target, federal funds rate target. Now the problem was that already at this time, problems in private financial markets were, uh, had caused the Fed to engage in all kinds of emergency lending. And through such lending, it tended to create new reserves for, uh, that would tend to find their way in the federal funds market. The, question, the challenge the Fed faced at the time, as it saw it, was that of keeping the federal funds rate at its 2% target despite ongoing emergency lending. Now, for quite some time, the way the Fed did that was by sterilizing those emergency loans. That is, the Fed uh, took bonds from its portfolio, sold bonds, tre treasury bills mainly, not bonds, from its portfolio to withdraw as many reserves from the uh, funds market, from the economy, as it was adding from its, uh, through its emergency lending program. I'll just switch forward to a slide that shows you this. Here you can see the light blue line shows the treasuries held by the Fed and the dark blue line shows total Federal Reserve assets. And as you can see, the total is constant despite emergency lending uh, up until after September, late September 2008. And the reason it's constant is because the Fed is selling, selling treasuries to make up for its uh, emergency lending through the TAF and through other programs. <clears throat> Let me switch back a bit. All of that worked fine until uh, the end of September. Well, perhaps I should show you this chart a little longer. Oops. End of September, as you can see, Fed assets start to grow tremendously. That's because of the vast increase in emergency lending following the Lehman's uh, fiasco and then AIG. And uh, as a result, uh, the Fed finds itself in a quandary. It doesn't have sufficient T-bills left in its portfolio to sterilize emergency lending on such a vast scale. So it does two other things. Instead of selling T-bills and sterilizing, one thing it does is to create the, the uh, uh, treasury uh, so-called uh, uh, supplementary financing account. You see the dotted line showing how it yanks some reserves into that for a while. But what it ultimately chooses to do as an alternative to sterilization or to the supplementary finance account is to implement interest on reserves three years ahead of schedule, as Paul said, with the idea that by paying interest on reserves, the Federal Reserve could, get, could sequester reserves that it was creating through its now substantial emergency lending so they wouldn't find their way into the federal funds market and the federal funds rate would stay at its target. Now, its target had been 2% for quite some time, but on the day it implemented interest on reserves, it also, I think significantly, 
reduce the target to 1.5% because by then it was perfectly clear that it, even with interest on reserves, 2% was not something it was going to be able to achieve. So that's when we have the switch to interest on reserves. And now to go back just for a moment, that's where that orange line is. Now, I think it should be apparent to everybody in this room looking at this chart, but that when the Fed took this step with the aim of trying not to have extra reserves it was creating provide any unwanted monetary stimulus, the thing that the U.S. economy desperately needed was more monetary stimulus. That is, instead of focusing on the headline on the uh, CPI, if they had looked at nominal GDP, a far more reliable indicator, certainly in retrospect of what's really happening to the economy, they might have realized that they'd actually been in a recession for some time, and we know now since December 2007, and, uh, and that they were heading into a deeper and deeper recession as this policy is going into place. So the first thing you need to know about interest on reserves uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> about interest on excess reserves particularly, which is something that is not emphasized enough, is that it was implemented originally as a contractionary measure to prevent reserve creation from having any stimulus effect, first of all, by reducing the federal funds rate below the Fed's preferred target, but ultimately by causing more spending and lending and all that. And that all of this was done at a time when, again, in retrospect, certainly, the Fed should have been anxious to contribute to more spending and lending and should have been willing to let the federal funds rate fall to a lower level as a result of uh, the, the fact that the economies, as, as it were, the equilibrium rate was falling. Oops, I keep pushing that red button. It is interesting, as Paul mentioned, that when the Fed first introduced interest on excess reserves, it introduced it at a rate that was below the targeted federal funds rate. That, of course, was a policy, that step was contrary to the purpose then purpose of interest on reserves, which was to sequester reserves, to get banks to hold on to them and not place them in the federal funds market. It's as if that at that time, and there is in fact evidence supporting this, the Fed thought that it could maintain a, a conventional corridor-like system, which is a system when, in which the interest rate paid on reserves is below the target rate, and still have interest on reserves serve the purpose of having banks hold on to reserves instead of putting them on the Fed funds market, the Fed quickly realized that, no, that you couldn't do that. If you wanted to stop the reserves from having a stimulus effect, you had to pay banks enough to make reserve holding more attractive than putting reserves, lending reserves to other banks. And so the Fed quickly got its act in order according to its true intentions, and we ended up with an interest rate on excess reserves that was allowed to be, that was consistently above the federal funds rate, the target federal funds rate, and the effective federal funds rate, where it has remained ever since. Now, that poses an interesting problem. Sorry. Maybe if I hold this upside down, I'll get it right. Well, first of all, let me just tell you how this creates a floor system, because once you've got the interest rate on reserves above the prevailing federal funds rate or above your target, it would be true if you had it at the target. Essentially, you're in a world where ordinary, the ordinary way the Fed controls interest rates no longer functions. In the ordinary corridor type system, which is shown on the left here, the supply of reserve balances is limited, first of all, and the interest rate on reserves is whatever it is. It could be zero. It could be some modest positive number. It's not attractive enough to make banks accumulate reserves. Therefore, when reserves are added to the system, they tend to go into the federal funds market, and you can see we'd be falling, going down the sloping uh, demand for reserve schedule, and the, the actual federal funds interest rate would fall. So adding reserves reduces the Fed funds rate. If the Fed has a lower target, it can get there. Taking reserves away has the opposite effect. In a floor system, interest on reserves is high enough to make banks want to hold any reserves that come their way, 
In that system, ordinary open market operations, which is creating new reserves or destroying them, doesn't change interest rate. You change, to, to change interest rate, you change the interest paid on excess reserves. So we've moved to a floor system, not so much as a deliberate plan at the time, but as an outcome of the Fed's plan to use interest on reserves as a way to keep reserve creation from stimulating uh, the economy and from lowering the effective Fed funds rate. You all with me? Okay. So <clears throat> I want to digress here uh, concerning a legal issue, which is very interesting, because uh, I, I don't think there are any active Federal Reserve people here. Maybe there are, but um, uh, the, the 2006 law that allowed the Fed to pay interest on reserves specified that the rate, as you can see in the underlined portion of the text here, the rate uh, paid on reserves was not to exceed the general level of short-term interest rates. And of course, in a floor system, particularly in, the pres in our Federal Reserve floor system, as we've seen, the, the interest rate on reserves is consistently above, above the Fed funds rate, but it's also above other short-term money market rates. Here, take a look. You can see the LIBOR rate the effective federal funds rate, and the interest rate on reserves, which is the dotted line, with rare exceptions, both of those money market rates are below, not above. So the, that is, the interest on reserves is, is above, not below or at the short-term market rates. And the same is true comparing the uh, interest on reserves to rates on most Treasury securities. For much of, two th of the recession years, you had to go out to two-year maturity before your Treasury bill would yield as much as reserves would. So the question is, how did the Fed get around this pesky law? I think you'll find this very interesting. The law didn't change in 2008. That law merely accelerated the implementation of interest on reserves. Well, in our wonderful, the way our government runs things, they often let the, the agencies write the details of the rules that they're supposed to abide by. Isn't that great? I wish I could do that. And, uh, and so here's what the Fed came up with when it finally promulgated the, the specific rules governing interest payment on reserves in 2015, supposedly consistent with the statutory requirements implemented in 2006. For purposes, I'm going to read it out loud just because I like it so much. For purposes of this section, short-term interest rates are rates on obligations with maturities of no more than one year, such as the primary credit rate and rates on term federal funds, term repurchase agreements, commercial paper, term euro dollar deposits, and other similar instruments. So first of all, why do they emphasize term? Reserves are essentially perfectly liquid overnight assets. So if you want a comparable market rate, short-term market rates, you would look for overnight rates. There are plenty of them you could look at, not term rates. But the kicker is the primary credit rate. That, of course, is known to most of you as the Fed's discount rate. And I am going to hold this upside down. Here's what the Fed says about its discount rate. The discount rate charged for primary credit, the primary credit rate, is set above the usual level of short-term market interest rates, blah, blah, blah. So the Fed is able to abide by a statute saying interest on excess reserves or interest on reserves cannot exceed the rate of interest on short-term rates by keeping it below a rate that it sets always well above short-term rates. Get it? They pay their lawyers a lot to come up with this stuff, I tell you, and they're worth it. All right, so what is the consequence of this? The first consequence is that the Fed has set up a system, right, with the original intent of making sure that creating reserves doesn't stimulate the economy. That was the intent in early October. It's a substitute for sterilization. The, uh, the funny thing is, by the end, even by the time they implemented it, but certainly within a month, say mid-November or uh, early to mid-November, the Fed recognized that what the economy really needed was more monetary stimulus. So how are you going to do that? Well, the way they did it the only way they knew to do it, if they were going to maintain the Fed funds rate, uh, the interest rate on reserves, was to create reserves and hope that somehow things will have changed. And specifically, 
create enough reserves, create so many reserves that maybe things change. In fact, only one thing changed. The only thing that changed between October 2006, when reserve creation wasn't supposed to stimulate the economy, and, and uh, well, starting in March, but certainly in, in uh, December 2008, when the Fed decided that it was going to resort to reserve creation to stimulate the economy, the only thing that changed was theory. What changed was now they had to have a theory that said that reserve creation, if you did enough of it, would in fact stimulate the economy, and that's what the theories behind large-scale asset purchases were. They were theories that explained how reserve creation would stimulate the economy even if the reserves all piled up in bank vaults. And those theories, as Ben Bernanke himself acknowledged, uh, were of doubtful uh, uh, value. He, the way he put it, he quipped, uh, some time after this all began, was that quantitative easing works in, th in practice, but not in theory. And this was an acknowledgment that the theories depended on a lot of, of uh, assumptions were, that uh, seemed not entirely convincing to many economists. Now, I don't want to go into a lot of detail about the real consequences of quantitative easing. It's controversial. There are lots of studies that show I think a majority of studies suggest that quantitative easing, the three rounds of quantitative easing, and particularly the first round, did succeed in lowering long-term interest rates to some extent. Now, that, even those results are not completely uncontroversial, and the extent, uh, the size of the effect is certainly controversial. What relatively few studies have been able to show is that those interest rate effects translated into broader macroeconomic effects, that is, effects on employment, output, spending, that sort of thing. There, the effectiveness of QE, particularly the later rounds, is not so clear. But the point is that we had to rely on a setup where monetary expansion, or rather reserve expansion, was somehow going to be effective in stimulating economic activity, even though the reserves piled up, and even though that meant that monetary aggregates like M2, which is shown by the dark line here, didn't do much, right? Because the aggregates only grow in proportion to reserve creation if the reserves, instead of piling up, are used as excess reserves are used uh, to stimulate, to make, or, or uh, go to encourage more lending of some of, of various kinds and deposit creation. So that didn't happen. So. So if you, if you believe, as I do, as a lot of people do, that uh, after all, having reserves contribute to growth of larger aggregates makes reserve creation more effective in stimulating activity, even if there are th ways in which it might be effective without creating larger aggregates, then you have to believe that paying interest on reserves was a, a counterproductive step certainly once we knew we wanted monetary stimulus. I just have this chart here to point out that until in, we had interest on reserves, it certainly wasn't the case that excess reserves would accumulate willy-nilly as the Fed created added to total reserves. That was never true in the past. In the past, banks held, as Paul mentioned, trivial amounts of excess reserves, and that amount, those amounts remained trivial regardless of changes to the total quantity of bank reserves. So the Fed's open market operations and reserve creation in those days didn't translate into accumulation of excess reserves. They did translate into growth in M2 and other broad aggregates, and so they had that much more of a stimulative effect. Most of the excess reserves, it bears pointing out, piled up in a relatively small number of banks, especially the largest six or so New York banks and uh, branches of foreign banks also, had also located in New York. And, uh, and that's because those banks, for various reasons, found accumulating reserves particularly attractive, especially the foreign banks. There are two reasons why these banks especially liked to hold on to reserves under the new regime. Uh, for all of them, their normal um, 
uh, net interest margin on loans was lower than for other kinds of banks. Therefore, reserves seemed relatively more attractive to them than to other banks. For foreign banks in particular, though, reserves didn't, uh, they, they were not paying FDIC insurance premiums, these foreign banks, because they were not doing deposit business in the U.S. Those premiums are assessed according to total assets. So, uh, uh, sorry, total liabilities. And therefore, by, uh, because of the fact that they were exempt, sorry, total assets, because they were exempt from the premiums, they benefited more by adding to excess reserves than, than domestic banks could. And to this day, you have those two sets of banks holding a lot of the excess reserves and even borrowing large amounts on euro-dollar markets uh, and to some extent on the Fed funds market uh, in order to arbitrage the difference between the borrowing rates on one hand and the interest rate on reserves on the other. So it's been wonderful for business for those banks. They like this system because it's a very easy way to earn money without expending any cost. It's, it's the easiest money a banker could possibly earn because there's nothing easier than holding reserve. Um, now, I want to talk about some of the longer-term consequences. I've suggested, I've suggested, and I could go into more detail on this, I've suggested that the uh, uh, interest on reserves uh, contributed to uh, the Fed's failure to stimulate the economy as much as it might have. And I should say, by the way, that you can think of that failure as QE maybe not working as well as it might, but there's more to the story than that. Interest on reserves, as long as they insisted on paying a positive rate, and as you know, the rate, of re rate on reserves was excess reserves never fell below, was never allowed to fall below 25 basis points, can also detract from recovery if the 25 basis points represents too high a Federal Reserve uh, uh, interest rate target, and arguably I think it was. If the Fed had, had, had allowed itself to go to zero, that is to revert in interest rate terms to the pre-floor uh, regime, we would have gotten more stimulus out of it. How much more? Well, it's not clear, of course, because that depends on where nat the natural interest rate was and wh how far below zero the Fed may have had to go to fully contribute to a, as rapid an econo a recovery as possible, and we don't know. But even a reduction from 25 basis points to zero, I think, would have made a substantial improvement. As you know, many other central banks in the world found it necessary and were capable of going to, uh, found it necessary to go to negative interest rates, were able to do that. So there's an obvious question here. If negative interest rates worked for some economies, did it really make sense for us to, to obstinately cling to a positive interest rate on reserves during the same uh, period? Okay, another consequence of interest on reserves is that it killed federal funds lending. Now, there are other things that have been cited as the reason for this, and I can argue about this if anyone doubts it, but I'm absolutely convinced that the, the factor that killed federal funds lending was interest on reserves because the most obvious thing that interest on reserves does in a floor system is to make reserves more attractive than lending on the federal funds market. So we went from, 60 billion, uh, from 200 billion or so in daily transactions in that market to about 50 or 60 billion, and the transactions that continued significantly were mainly not interbank transactions. They were uh, arbitrage transactions between the non-banks that have Fed deposit balances but cannot earn interest on reserves and banks that could, like those big New York banks I mentioned and foreign banks. So the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, they couldn't earn, they weren't eligible for interest on reserves if they had Fed balances they would lend them to these other banks for a share of the interest on reserves, and the other banks were profiting from a six percentage, six basis point spread or something like that. So why, is it, why does it matter if we have no federal funds activity, interbank activity? Well, if you believe some very important theories, then you believe that that market was a very important mar venue for interbank monitoring. It was one of the unsecured markets that was, uh, it was a place for unsecured lending among banks, and so it meant that banks that took part in the market had a good reason to track 
which other banks were safe so they wouldn't be caught lending even overnight to a bank that could fail. And if you believe economists like Rocher and Tyrol cited here from a 1996 study, you may remember Tyrol won the Nobel Prize. I think it was 2000. Was it the? It was uh, not not long ago, 2014, 15. Uh, they wrote in anticipation of all this. Insofar as it discourages interbank monitoring, quote, government intervention destroys the very benefit of a decentralized banking system. That's a very strong statement, but. Uh, it's not something, whether, whether, whether they're exaggerating or not, the fact remains that in most other countries that have experimented with floor systems during the crisis, or that had them before the crisis for that matter, the majority have gone either back to a corridor systems or have introduced so-called tiered systems where reserves uh, are not attractive at the margin, though they're attractive up to some threshold level. That means that Excess, any new reserve creation by the central bank causes the banks to lend the reserves. Those countries have moved away from floor systems in every case citing that the desire to restore unsecured lending markets and to revive activity in those markets. The United States is the only country where Fed officials have not said a word about this being an important uh, concern. It's the only place I know of. England, ECB, you see discussions of this issue. So it concerns me a lot. And Tyrol and Joche are only two out of at least a dozen economists who've written about the importance of these, uh, this interbank monitoring and unsecured lending markets contributing to it. The other thing that uh, I think has been a, an unappreciated consequence or underappreciated consequence of the switch to the floor system is its effect on bank lending of all time uh, of all kinds. You can see from this chart what happened to bank lending in the crisis and how it's it's recovered in most forms. It seems to have recovered, but uh, slowly. Of course, what we don't know, we can't tell from simple graphs like this, whether the growth, the recovery of lending could have been greater than it actually was. But the next chart will suggest that it might well have been greater if banks hadn't been induced to hold reserves. As a simple point of balance sheet arithmetic, right, if you take the aggregate balance sheet of the commercial banking system, if banks are holding more of one asset, right, they could be holding more of another asset regulations and incentives aside, right? It's the, it's, it's the portfolio choices, including that are governed by relative returns plus regulatory requirements, of course, that determine how banks allocate their uh, portfolio to different interest earning or non-interest earning assets. Well, what happened after interest on reserves, and you can take my word for it that these lines diverge on top in October 2008 and not at some other date. What happens is we have uh, lending of all kinds, which was roughly 100% of bank deposits because the, difference, the only difference between them is that small cushion pre-October 2008 of excess reserves. Lending of all kinds, which had been uh, approximately 100% of, of, uh, of uh, deposits, now becomes 80% reserves become 20%. And uh, I submit this means that banks are lending less because they're holding more reserves, obviously, but that this is a, this is a causal result of the, uh, of the uh, switched interest on reserves. I have a long discussion in the book that explains why, yes, believe it or not, 25 basis points could be enough to make a bank prefer holding reserves to making a commercial loan, even at six or seven or maybe nine uh, 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 percent interest. Once you factor in things like the low, the, the interest uh, margin, which is the difference between what reserve, what uh, it costs to borrow funds and what banks earn on the funds, and then you factor in failure. Uh, uh, sorry, that's I switched. I thought I had a chart for the. Uh, I don't have it. Uh, if you factor in the uh, non-interest costs, you factor in loan loss provisions during the crisis. Uh, loan loss provisions could easily be four percentage points or more for some banks. Uh, you end up 
be very, making it very easy for a bank to say, yeah, I think I'll just sit on reserves, thank you very much, if they pay 25 basis points. And, and the number of loans that might have been attractive at zero basis points is not insignificant, the difference. Okay, uh, I'm going to switch ahead because I'm running out of time. The other final result of all this is that the Fed plays a much bigger role in the payment system. It has become a super intermediary. It is managing a lot more of our savings. It's borrowing them from the banks, and it's deciding where those savings go. And, of course, right now they're invested in various treasury and mortgage-backed securities and not in the things that ordinary commercial banks would invest in. This shows the percentage of uh, Fed assets compared to total to commercial bank assets, and as you can see, it's now 30% of the the commercial banks, and it used to be something like 7.5%. I'm going to switch to my last slide. Uh, One of the biggest fears I have about the floor system is fiscal. And it's it's not that it costs a lot. Yes, the Fed is paying a lot of interest to banks, uh, paying a lot of interest, but it's also holding more assets because the banks are lending to it and funding its balance sheet to that much greater an extent than before. So you might argue that the interest payments on excess reserves are just rewarding banks for uh, for, gener- for passing their savings, for passing uh, resources to the Fed. No, I think the big fiscal danger consists of the fa- very fact that some floor system advocates see as a virtue of it that the size of the Fed's balance sheet no longer has any connection to the stance of monetary policy. They're independent. But what does that mean? Well, to put it uh, as baldly as possible, in the good old days, right, the good old days, if the Treasury or any other interest group said, buy some of our assets, help us out, we need to, we need to, we could use a little bit of your monetization, the Fed could say, well, even if everything else permitted us to do that, we can't because it will alter the stance of monetary policy and we won't meet our inflation target. Now they can't say that. The Fed could monetize anything to almost any extent and it wouldn't have, it would have long, special QE effects, whatever those might be, but what it wouldn't do is generate growth of monetary aggregates and inflation. So what we've done is we've created We've turned the size of the Fed's balance sheet into a free, political, a free parameter. If monetary policy doesn't tell the Fed how big that should be, something else will. And that something else could be all kinds of things, but you can bet that politics is going to be uh, uh, among them uh, and, and pressure from all kinds of special interests. So to sum up, uh, the floor system, I believe, interfered with the payment of interest, the the, uh, uh, recovery prevented the Fed from promoting recovery as effectively as it might have. It undermined, destroyed the interbank federal funds market and thereby undermined an important source of uh, venue for interbank monitoring. It uh, created a vast shift in the allocation of savings from private bank lending to businesses, consumers, etc., to lending to the Fed, which then lends to government agencies in the U.S. Treasury, which is arguably not as productive. And finally, the floor system has created a fiscal uh, Trojan horse by which we might find the Fed being dragged into all kinds of fiscal exercises because it can without violating its monetary mandate. Thank you very much. George, I, got, I have to take issue with you on, the, on your last point here. I looked at this very carefully. This is not a Trojan horse. It's a Trojan pig. It, it is a piggy bank for wooden nickels. Do you see the wooden nickel at the top? That's, that's got to be what it is, right? I don't know. Well, anyway, tonight um, we're pleased to have... My get. I'm going to be pretty lucky. <laughs> <laughs> we have two distinguished economists who are joining us here today to provide their reviews and commentary on George's new book. Speaking first will be Bill Nelson of the Bank Policy Institute. Bill Nelson is the chief economist of the Bank Policy Institute, or BPI. BPI is the offspring of a merger between the Financial Services Roundtable and the Clearinghouse Association. 
and that merger happened this summer, if the BPI name is new to you. Prior to BPI, Bill was the chief economist at the Clearinghouse. Before joining the Clearinghouse, Bill was deputy director of the Division of Monetary Affairs in the Federal Reserve Board here in Washington, where he worked for 23 years, and Bill and I worked together for something like nine years of those 23 years. Uh, I left a long time ago, though. At the board, he was one of the leaders of the ongoing system-wide review of monetary policy implementation framework. Bill will be coming up in a second, but let me just announce the second one so I don't have to interrupt. Our second economist discussing today will be David Beckworth. David Beckworth is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Prior to his position at Mercatus, he was an economist at the U.S. Department of Treasury and a member of the faculty at Western Ken Kentucky University. His research focuses on monetary policy. He's the author of Boom and Bust Banking, The Causes and Cures of the Great Recession, and articles appearing in Barron's, Investor's Business Daily, The New Republic, The Atlantic, and the National Review, and he hosts a weekly podcast called Macro Musings. So first, Bill, please. Let me start by thanking Paul for the invitation to discuss George's new book, a task I take up with pleasure. George is a keen and passionate intellect, as well as kind and generous with his time, and I always enjoy our discussions. Moreover, those of us who think the Fed should adopt a corridor rather than a floor system to implement monetary policy are a dying breed and must stick together. Before diving in, let me state for clarity that when I refer to a corridor system, I basically mean the pre-crisis approach to implementing monetary policy with the addition of interest on required and excess reserves, but with IOER rate 50 to 100 basis points below market rates. So I was amused to read the description of a corridor system in the November FOMC minutes as one in which aggregate excess reserves are sufficiently limited that money market interest rates are sensitive to small changes in the supply of reserves. The Federal Reserve actively adjusts reserve supply in order to keep its policy rate close to target. By contrast, a floor system was described as one where Money market interest rates are not sensitive to small fluctuations in the demand for supply of reserves, and the stance of monetary policy is instead transmitted from the Federal Reserve's administered rates to market rates, an approach that has been effective in controlling short-term interest rates in the United States since the financial crisis, as well as in other countries where central banks have used this approach. The corridor system sounds awful. Market interest rates so sensitive to reserve supply that policy will require active intervention by the Fed? Who could possibly support such a system? Well, George provides a number, several good reasons why everyone should. First, despite the description in the FOMC minutes, a floor system will cause the Fed to have a much greater footprint in the financial system, and thus the economy and society, than a corridor system. It is underappreciated how light the imprint was of the Fed under the pre-crisis framework. The Fed conducted monetary policy by means of relatively small repos with broker-dealers, the Fed was a small player in a big market, but it wasn't committed to fixing rates in that market. Those small repo transactions allowed the Fed to, have, uh, to influence the Fed funds market, a relatively small market, where the Fed had tight control of both supply and demand, but was usually not a counterparty. Changes in the Fed funds rate were transmitted effectively to other money market rates, including the repo market and term markets. Thus, without being an important counterparty to anyone, the Fed still had effective control of interest rates and thereby the economy. By contrast, a floor system would leave the Fed the financial intermediary of first resort. As George points out, a floor system encourages banks to hold unlimited quantities of excess reserves and lend a correspondingly large part of the savings they secure from depositors to the Fed. Instead of banks holding treasuries, to meet their liquidity needs, the Fed will hold the treasuries and banks will hold deposits at the Fed. Instead of the treasury keeping its deposits at commercial banks, it will just keep its funds at the, at the Fed. More on that in a minute. Moreover, if the reasons the Fed likes a floor system is that it hopes to control money markets more broadly rather than just the Fed funds rate, and doing so using borrowing and lending facilities, not scarcity, it will inevitably find itself on one side or the other of a huge amount of transactions. 
and it is not clear the Fed can successfully control the repo market, a massive market for which the Fed controls neither demand nor supply, without massive interventions. While the corridor system offer good monetary control with a small footprint, a floor system may offer relatively poor control with the Fed counterparty to all. George also points out that the large interest payments under a floor system will resort, result in horrible political optics. Currently, the Fed is paying interest at an annual rate of about $37 billion. If excess reserves decline and interest rates rise gradually, as projected by the FOMC, then interest payments will slowly decline. However, if the demand for excess reserves remains elevated, or if the Fed needs to increase the Fed funds rate quickly to prevent an unwanted rise in inflation, interest payments would rise, possibly sharply. Moreover, as George points out, the main recipients of interest on, ex on reserves are some foreign banks and the very largest U.S. banks. Congress might see such large payments to banks as unacceptable and so take away or constrain the Fed's ability to pay interest on reserves, especially if the rising rates were seen as holding back growth. I'd add that a large balance sheet will probably reduce the Fed's income relative to a small balance sheet, which could also have political implications. The Fed's expected net income is lower, not higher, for each Treasury security it holds in excess of currency outstanding. Treasury term premiums are negative, have been negative for years, and are likely to remain negative. If the five-year term premium remains about minus 50 basis points, the Fed operates a floor system, and excess reserves are about $2 trillion, then the Fed will earn and remit to Treasury $10 billion less each year than if the IOER rate were well below the Fed funds rate and excess reserves were near zero. George discusses some of the flaws in the process by which the Fed ended up in a floor system, including the fact that the decision not to sell assets as part of normalization was driven in part by a desire to avoid recognizing losses. But the process was actually even worse than he describes. For one thing, the Fed backed into a floor system in large part because it made time inconsistent plans in order to forge an internal consensus to provide more accommodation, only to later conclude that those plans were unworkable. For example, when considering the flow-based asset purchase program, the committee based its decision on a staff balance sheet forecast in which the, the, the purchases would end in six months, even though the staff economic forecast showed no decline in the unemployment rate over that period. The forecast for a limited purchase program was based in part on an implausible plan that, if necessary, the FOMC would simply announce that the program wasn't working. In the event, the program continued for 21 months. Moreover, there was a Roach Motel element to the process. You can check in, but you can't check out. Specifically, the Fed has taken actions that have left it in a floor system for an extended period, and those actions make a floor system look attractive and a corridor system look implausible. With excess reserves toppling two and three quarters trillion, the Fed funds market should have died entirely, and today, mostly, as George had mentioned, consists of GSEs lending to FBOs. Now the floor system ad advocates ask, how could the Fed target the interest rate in such an illiquid and odd market? With interest rates at zero, commercial banks were no longer able to provide the Treasury interest on its deposits, so the Treasury switched its deposits entirely to the Fed. The resulting increase in volatility of that account which causes corresponding volatility in the supply of reserves, hasn't troubled the Fed in a floor system, but would make a corridor system unworkable. There have been some important market developments this year that suggest a floor system could be even worse than George imagined. While the Fed had projected that excess reserves would need to be about $500 billion in a floor system, starting this spring with excess reserves about one and three quarters trillion dollars, some signs of reserve scarcity began to show up in money markets raising the prospect that the Fed would need to have an even bigger balance sheet than anticipated. For my part, I think the episodes of scarcity are temporary phenomena as banks adjust their asset liability mix in light of changing market signals, but the truth will out as the balance sheet continues to decline. Your end could be particularly interesting as tax payments boost the Treasury balance at the Fed, pushing excess reserves down further. Moreover, because GSIB surcharges are calculated on a year-end basis, large broker-dealers will shrink their balance sheets. Plus, European banks' leverage ratios are calculated on a quarter-end basis, adding further to the pressure. Perhaps market participants have all secured the funding they need, and year-end will turn out to be a snooze. But if it is a train wreck and the Fed intervenes, it will cast doubt on the claim that a floor system is a set-it-and-forget-it way to conduct monetary policy. <laughs>
I will note for the record that there are several reasons to oppose, oppose, to oppose a floor system that George discusses that I do not agree with. Most significantly, the Fed's large-scale asset purchases successfully stimulated economic growth by lowering long-term interest rates. The associated added reserve balances had no impact on growth at worst and provided a little stimulus at best. I don't want to try to resolve the 50-year disagreement between monetarists and Keynesians on how monetary policy works this evening. That said, reading the monetarist parts of George's book felt similar to arriving at a college in the South in the 1980s, having grown up in a liberal northern suburb. I had no idea people held, still held such views. Lastly, it is important to recognize that the floor versus corridor decision is far from a no-brainer. No there are some strong arguments for a floor system. Last week, I asked leading supporters of a floor system to list their top reasons. Here are the ones I found most compelling. There could be large swings in reserve demand as banks switch between treasuries and excess reserves to satisfy their LCR in rea reaction to small differences in T-bill rates. Banks could need $800 to $900 billion on hand to meet immediate outflows if there's another crisis. If banks pass on IOER to the depositors, the Friedman rule will be closer to being satisfied. Banks will be less likely to throttle their intraday payments, reducing the associated systemic risk. And just as it is more efficient for intraday liquidity to be freely available, not scarce, it is more efficient for overnight liquidity to be freely available, not scarce. That was the argument given. Now, these are all good points. But on the other side, though, I think that the, arching, the overarching question those who think a corridor system is unworkable must answer is, the Fed operated the corridor system successfully for decades. Why can't it do so again? Thank you, and congratulations, George. Thanks, Bill. David, please. All right, well, thank you, Paul, for inviting me to this event. Thank you, George, for a good read. I share many of your sympathies in the book, but I want to focus on the last chapter of the book, policy normalization, and I want to make the case that we might be closer to a corridor system than George anticipates, and maybe Christmas will come early for George. Um, maybe not, but I think we have some signs, some evidence that we are closer to a corridor system than many anticipate. So I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to ask how close are we to a corridor system? And I'm going to suggest that maybe there are developments that uh, will put us there sooner than anticipated. And to, to think about that, I want to just recap part of our journey um, over the past few years of the Fed's balance sheet, the liability side. I want to first look at currency. Since 2008, currency um, as the part of the Fed's balance sheet has gone from about $800 billion to $1.7 trillion, so a growth of about $900 billion. Uh, reserves have increased, reaching a peak about uh, – 2.8 trillion, and they've declined about a trillion since they've begun winding down the reserves. So reserves have fallen roughly a trillion dollars. There's a few other categories on there we can add on top of that. The Treasury General Account that Bill referenced, that's grown quite a bit with the floor system and the reverse repos and some other categories. So right now the balance sheet is about $4 trillion. But reserves have declined quite a bit. The question is, well, is that enough? Well, we have that going on, and I would also mention that at the same time, we also have uh, Trump's deficits adding lots of new Treasury bills to circulation, which have pushed up overnight uh, Treasury repo rates, which is also putting strain on the floor system. And just to take a closer look at some of the clues or evidence that this system is maybe reaching its bound, I want to look first at some interest rates. So here I have this first black line is the interest on excess reserve rate. I want to show the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation um, repo rate. And this rate here, now George had a slide that showed this better, went back farther in time. But this rate typically has been below the interest and excess reserves, but recently it's been going above. And the past few rate hikes has been persistently above. Now some commentators are, uh, suggest that this rate overstates the, the uh, repo treasury yield. So if we look at a different one, this is the Bank of New York Mellon's Treasury repo rate, it's been below, but even it recently has gone above and seems to be persistently above interest and excess reserves. If this were to be sustained and be large enough, then you get to the place where, once again, holding reserves has an opportunity cost and kind of ushers us back toward a corridor system. 
Um, given that this has happened and this is a big market, through arbitrage, as was mentioned earlier, it's affected the federal funds rate. So you can see the federal funds rate, George had a similar slide, has, has converged for the most part to the interest and excess reserves. And again, why has this happened? On one hand, it's because of the Fed's shrinking of the balance sheet, pulling reserves out, as well as, I believe, and the, the Fed makes the same argument that the number of uh, the Treasury bill supply has gone up quite a bit and increased Treasury repo rates. So together, that suggests we're getting close to the limit of what a, a floor system can, can tolerate. But there's more evidence than, than this. I want to point out a recent survey that the Federal Reserve took in September 2018, and it gives another clue as to where we are on this journey, potential journey to uh, a corridor system. Uh, it was a survey of 51 banks, 30 domestic, 21 uh, foreign banks, and collectively these banks hold two-thirds of all bank reserves outstanding. And they asked this question, what is the lowest comfortable level of reserve balances that you're willing to hold given the current constellation of short-term rates? So constellation meaning where market rates are today. So I just showed you the graph that showed that they're pretty close. Um, and some market rates are actually above interest and excess reserve. So given this, these current conditions, how low can you go? And get rid of reserves before it becomes a binding constraint, before it becomes uncomfortable. And the number they came up with is $617 billion. Now, I, that's all they had, but I'm going to do a little extrapolation. If that's two-thirds, I'm going to just approximate, take another third, and that takes us to uh, close to just under a trillion dollars at $927 billion. And that's, it's interesting, this is what banks reported, because this is pretty close to several estimates of what, how low the level of reserves could go before we are ushered into a <coughs> corridor system. So this, I, I look at this, and, and I, I think of two stories, or two ways of getting to a corridor system. Kind of the story being told here tonight is we keep reducing supply of reserves until we get to the point that, once again, reserves are scarce, there's opportunity costs, we're on that sloping part of the demand curve for reserves. And that's kind of a supply story, but there's also a demand story. Demand could have shifted out as well, putting us on that sloping part of the curve sooner, and maybe we are getting close to that point. If, if banks can only tolerate a level at about $900 billion, just under a trillion, we might be getting close. So if I take that number now, and I just I take that graph I showed you before, and I extrapolate out, I take the trend of currency growth, project it forward, and then I take you know, the, the typical reduction every month we see in reserves of $50 billion, and I plug it into the chart, that takes us to about 2020 when we would hit a corridor system. If, if $900 billion is just the bare minimum banks can hold on to, effectively they've increased their structural demand for reserves, we could find ourselves in a corridor system by 2020. And if I add in some of these other categories, that leaves us the balance sheet close to $3 trillion, which would be about 13% of nominal GDP at that point in time. It would still be a larger balance sheet relative to GDP than before, but it, it, we might find ourselves in a corridor system with a larger balance sheet. Now, this may not be the end of the story, though. This is, again, based on what the, the um, bankers say, but they also revealed something else that was interesting and, and suggests that everything has a price, including the amount of reserves they want to hold. And so they asked this question, um, how high would short-term interest rates have to rise above interest and excess reserves before you budge, before that, that $600 billion, which I extrapolated $900 billion, before that lowers even more? What would it take for you to let go of the, that bare minimum amount? And they asked several amounts. They said, what if it goes up five basis points above? So we have market, the constellation of rates going five basis points above interest and excess reserves, and only 8% said they would lower the amount of reserves they want to hold. So 5% wouldn't be enough. Now, they asked the second question, what if we do 25 basis points? What if market rates are 25 basis points higher? Then we see that 46% of the banks said they would. And I found this interesting because in George's book, he mentions uh, the study by uh, Dukowski and House in 2017, and they have a model that shows if that spread goes six basis points or higher, you would see a movement back toward a corridor system. Banks wouldn't be hoarding reserves. And so unfortunately, this survey only goes from five basis points to 25 basis points. But somewhere in between there, some threshold is reached where banks are willing to forego a lot more of their reserves. Then they asked one other question, what if it jumps to 50 basis points? And then you get 49% of them are willing to, to lower their um, holdings. So we might be 
closer to a corridor system than anticipated. Now, if this happens, of course, it would take even longer to unwind the balance sheet, and that might take us out several more years. Um, I also want to add there is a lot of uncertainty surrounding this, and, and one other interesting observation I'm going to add along those lines is to look at the type of banks that have been unloading the reserves. Who, who has been getting rid of most of these reserves as the Fed has been shrinking its balance sheet? And kind of the, the story told is these bigger banks are going to have a harder time because of the regulatory issues, the liquidity coverage ratio. Um, and there's ways we can think they might get by that at some point. It becomes profitable or, or, or cost efficient enough to substitute treasuries for reserves. But just to look at what's happened, this is data from the Federal Reserve's H8 database. And let's look first at the small banks. So the large, small domestic banks, large domestic banks are the top 25 largest, according to this data set. And what's interesting is the small banks haven't done a lot of change. They've, they've lowered their holdings about $80 billion, about 5%. If you look at this line, it's hard to see much change at all. Um, what has changed is large banks have done some um, unwinding of reserves. They've lowered about 30, uh, I'm sorry, 300 billion. And then the foreign banks have done most of it. And then foreign banks make a lot of sense, as George and others have mentioned. They were arbitraging that spread. Uh, what's surprising to me, though, is that the small banks are still holding on with dear life to their reserves. So there's a lot of questions unanswered as we go down this path. And maybe the numbers reported in that survey may not hold up when we get down um, even farther down the, 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 uh, the level of reserves being drained. But I think we might be closer to a corridor system than many anticipate. I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, George, would you like to respond? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, both uh, David and Bill for their comments. Uh, I really appreciate it. I, I think that uh, I'm actually, uh, Bill, I think you, you and I are probably closer together on some of these issues you brought up than you may think. I wanted to just say as a, as a, as a point of agreement uh, that, that I think uh, you recognize is that a lot of these criticisms, you made the point that people are saying when we can't go back to a corridor system or we can't institute a corridor system because if you look at the way things are working right now, clearly if they keep working that way when we switch, we're going to have all kinds of problems. And um, this is a classic ex example of an argument that violates what economists call the Lucas critique after Bob Lucas, who said you, 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 have, you have to realize that the way uh, that you have to consider how uh, when you have a regime change, lots of things can change, and so you cannot judge the effectiveness of an alternative regime by assuming that everything that exists today is a fixed parameter, like the way, way the Treasury is managing its cash and that sort of thing. So we have to be very careful not to uh, accept criticisms of proposals to go back to a corridor system uh, that uh, that fall afoul of the Lucas critique. We have to be very careful uh, about uh, whether their their criticisms are, in fact, assuming things are constants that would themselves change. On large scale asset purchases, and I'm glad Joe's here because I want him, particular Joe Gagnon, to hear this. I'm not I'm not a, 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 I'm not a diehard opponent of the idea. But I, what, I, what, what, what I blame the Fed's floor system for is not so much that it's, – it's not that the Fed resorted to large – I'm not opposed to large-scale asset purchases, but I think the only excuse for resorting to them is because you've fallen into a liquidity trap. And there's no need to ever fall into a liquidity trap unless you're at a genuine, natural, or legal lower bound. What the interest on reserve policy the Fed instituted did was to create a quite artificial above zero lower bound, ultimately just 25 basis points. So they have to resort. There's no way to go except large-scale asset purchases because we know that at the, at the lower bound, whether it's artificial or not, uh, your or open market operations become uh, open market purchases of the ordinary scale become perfectly ineffective. And I think Joe and I both agree the problem with interest on reserves at that point is, is that it was positive. But I would go further and say if we'd had a – even in a corridor system, you have a zero lower bound problem. What you don't have is an above zero lower bound problem. So how, how about if I make this concession to floor system advocates? We should, we should, we should always be ha prepared to go to a floor system in a crisis where you can't go any lower. <laughs> if your interest rate can't go any lower – then fine, have a floor system. 
where the interest rate and the federal funds rate are uh, the same, the Fed funds target. But why do it at any other time? That's and in a normal corridor system, you usually have an interest rate on reserves that's below your target federal funds rate. In a crisis, if you cannot avoid having those things be the same, fine. Um, so that's the criticism. Uh, on um, the Friedman rule, is the only other thing I want to talk about uh, regarding with respect to Bill's comments. I think actually the Friedman rule, properly understood, uh, would we could you could implement it perfectly well with a corridor system, uh, um, and uh, I note two points about this. The there's a well there's a study by Canaveri and several co-authors co that suggests that the the uh, taking into account the presence of distortionary taxes and this gets kind of very, even more wonkish than other things we've been saying. But the point is the Friedman rule assumes no distortionary taxes of any kind. And in that case, you want the interest on, rate on reserves to be exactly what would make the reserve holding not, not have any opportunity cost. You can do no just as well holding reserves as you could by lending in the sh money markets, short-term money markets anyway. But uh, in the presence of distortionary taxes, it turns out uh, that makes a difference. And these guys have taken that into account, and they got the estimate that the Friedman rule interest rate should have been about 40 basis points below the uh, the uh, Fed funds rate. Well, you can't, that means yeah. you've got a corridor system. Right. Uh, by the way, though, on this question of interest rate pass-through, one thing we do know is that as the interest rate on excess reserves has gone up since the crisis, it hardly has shown up in any change in bank deposit rates at all. So as far as that part of the story of optimal interest rate payments, well, it hasn't been working very well anyway under the floor system. Turning uh, to David's points, uh, well, uh, regarding the hope of having an early Christmas present, uh, besides being something of a Scrooge, I'm also a congenital pessimist. So no, I don't think we're going to have a spontaneous switch to the floor system. My main reason for saying that is well, twofold. First, I don't think we're quite as close as, as some of, uh, of the statistics David presented suggest, but I do think that uh, threshold of a billion, uh, sorry, of a one trillion dollars is probably about right for the minimum reserves below which they can't retain, uh, maintain a, a floor system. But of course, the Fed has an easy solution to this. If it's a question that either the floor system has to go or the a reserve unwind has to go, the unwind will go. They'll stop unwinding. And if they need to, they'll create more reserves again. Uh, and I, I think at this point, the way the discussion is going, the con overwhelming consensus within the Fed, or what seems to be that, favoring a floor system, and particularly at the New York Fed, which is, is, uh, is, is really driving uh, that consensus, uh, I don't think they would let it go. If they had to stop shrinking the balance sheet, then that's, that's uh, what, what they'll do. Um, and one more po quick point. The one thing, David, I don't think proves much of anything is the fact that the effective funds rate has gotten closer and closer to the interest rate on excess reserves. I think floor system advocates will claim that that's not a bug but a feature, and I think they'll have a point. In an orthodox floor system, those rates should be the same. So all we're seeing, to, to, to play devil's advocate, is we're seeing the leaks become less of a problem, not the floor system becoming less uh, 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 sustainable as far as that relationship's concerned. Well, by itself, I would agree. It's just within the context of overnight market repo rates going above IOER and pulling the Fed funds rate up. That's where I, I see more of, more of a context story. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're rapidly uh, running to a... Uh, out of time here, so uh, let, before I take maybe one or two questions from the audience, let me let me just say um, there's a little bit of a risk that you might come away thinking you just uh, watched an economist uh, happy hour at a, in an economics department, but I, I assure you George's book is very accessible, very well written, very clear, very to the point. The details are all there if you want to read them, uh, but he's he's very clear in explaining everything. Uh, it's an easy read. Uh, it'd be a great read over the holiday weekends in front of a fire. I really think he does an excellent job. 
of, of laying out the issues and, and, and raising important issues that need to be discussed. So with that little pitch for Thank you, George, um, can we take a couple of questions? Uh, how about back there? Okay. Uh, wait for the mic, please, and tell us who you are. And okay. no speeches, a question, please. Okay. My name is Mark Tenney from Mathematical Finance Company, and I've been involved with the American Academy of Actuaries in calibrating their risk models, which are called mm -hmm. economic scenario generators. They generate like 10,000. Okay. Question. Okay. They generate thousands of scenarios of interest rates. Mm -hmm. And the biggest problem is if short rates start close to zero, once they go back to 5%, these models have mean reversion, Sh short rates can't get back to zero. And this is true in pretty much insurance risk management and to a large extent derivatives <coughs> risk management in banks uh, because they're all based on log normal models. And so all the, all the interest rate risk management of the life insurance industry and the derivatives industry has a real problem with short-term rates start at zero, go to five, and come back to zero. They can't do that in their models. And I don't know how, how your work here contributes to thinking about that or how these models need to be changed. Is that an important scenario? Do we have to have lots of those scenarios in our risk models? Uh, I'm pretty sure my work contributes absolutely nothing to this problem, to solving it. I don't think it'll make it any worse. <laughs> is there another uh, question but out then, there? I think that the, the, the point is it's the problem of models, right? Yeah, the model's wrong. The models, the, the obviously, interest is, rates can, can stay yeah. low for a long time. Yeah. Joe, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, Joe Gagno with Peterson Institute. Um, so uh, my question is about something that none of you mentioned. I want to know anyone who can answer it or all of you. But um, uh, the, the Fed has another rate the overnight RRP rate, which no one really talked about, and it was set at a quite a different value from the interest on reserves. And how, how, my question is, how much do you think that mattered? And in particular, because a lot of, George, your, your concern is that the IOR rate was 25 basis points, and, and that gap above zero, um, you want to say, uh, mattered a lot. I guess I would agree with you in principle, but maybe in practice, um, the magnitude I didn't think is that much. But the, the, the gap between that and O and RRP is the same. So if, if the first gap is a big gap, that is 25 basis points over zero, isn't the second gap equally big and important? And how would you have told the Fed, what would you have told the Fed to do with the two rates and how should they be managed in the future? Well, uh, yeah, I didn't mention the, uh, the overnight uh, reverse repo rate. Uh, which is a, yet another cog in the wheels, inside wheels of the way the system operated. Uh, it was added on to the system as a way uh, to, they were disappointed that the federal funds rate sagged below the interest rate on reserves. It would, the two things would be equal if all the banks that, all the, uh, the depository institutions that had accounts to the Fed, if they all earned the interest rate on reserves. But because some didn't and you had those those uh, arbitrage lending between banks and non-banks, it went below. Well, the Fed put in interest, uh, these overnight repos, basically as a way to pay something equivalent to interest on reserves, but at a lower rate, a less favorable rate, to the GSEs, but also to some other counterparties. So that meant that, has, that the federal funds rate could sag, but only as no lower than the overnight repo rate. I consider that all a kind of just a, a fine-tuning of the floor system, if you like, but not essential to its operation. I never thought that the leaks... The leaks are important if what you're trying to do is control the, the effective funds rate. That's still your target. Obviously, you can't have perfect control. The Fed wanted to get it a little bit closer to perfect and so on. Uh, but I, I don't see the leaks as the problem with the floor system. I, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the, the, the inherent problems of the system. I, uh, if I were, had been king of the world in 2008, uh, 2009, I should say, I would have said, let's, let's set the interest rate on reserves at zero and let's not have any overnight repo. They didn't have any yet, but I wouldn't have, there wouldn't have been any need for it. Uh, because uh, that would have been zero two, presumably, if it had existed at that time, and uh, that's all. I'm not sure if somebody had pressed me whether I would have tried, said maybe we should pay negative interest on reserves. That that's a good question, a very difficult proposition apparently for the United States 
uh, more difficult than for other countries. But I would, I would certainly have said, let's go to zero. Let's see how much that helps. Let's squeeze the, the uh, conventional monetary policy lemon until the, all the pips are out. And then if we can't get anything else out of it, then we can play around with negative interest rates or large-scale asset purchases or forward guidance because in that circumstance, you certainly don't have a choice but to resort to these other unconventional devices or do nothing. Okay, last question over here, and it's got to be short, and the Sorry. answer's got to be short. Sorry about that. We've got to sell some books here. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm Francisco Martin Ray. I work at the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, it's kind of a broader question. I, I think there's a lot of uncertainty um, that we're seeing. I think the IMF came out recently and said they're starting to see, you know, whenever the recession they were trying to expect it in 2021, they're th looking at it closer to 2020. Uh, as students of the Fed, uh, what is your worry in terms of we have fewer tools than we did in 08 to put against the crisis? If a crisis or another recession hits in the next few years, what do you think the tools are at their disposal, and what are your biggest worries where we are today? Well, I don't think there are fewer tools, uh, not many fewer. Uh, uh, Dodd-Frank has uh, put some constraints on some of the things the Fed can do. But, uh, but uh, I don't uh, the one thing that concerns me most is uh, that, that, that with the floor system, Another crisis, if it does bring interest rates down, and particularly if the Fed doesn't let them go to zero again, uh, then we'll be talking about a $6 trillion Fed or more. We'll be talking about massive uh, uh, purchases, and we'll be uh, seeing the Federal Reserve get into a situation where it's intermediating, intermediating pretty much all of our savings. There's not much room for anything else. The, the, the pink piggy bank won't be big enough, is the what you're saying. The piggy bank, uh, yeah. So that's my concern is, is not that they don't have tools, but that, uh, that, uh, that they'll be forced to use, again, some of these unconventional tools that have long-run consequences that are, uh, they have a certain uh, hystericis effect, and that, that mainly consists of the Fed becoming a bigger part of the payment system. So uh, I, I'm going to have to call time on the discussion. Uh, being economists, we could go on forever, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, please, uh, we're going to have some wine and cheese, and George is here, and we have some books, and I'm sure he's happy to sign them. So let's thank our panelists and George. Thank you all very much. Good discussion. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you probably want to sign some books.